Okay, we are recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our lesson on the rhetorical appeals. So this will be a continuation uh, from our lesson on Monday on the, uh, the rhetorical situation. Um, so you may have noticed our setup is a little different today. The reason is, is because I've just learned recently that PowerPoint has its own subtitled feature. Um, and so I want to play around with that a little bit. And you may also notice I'm wearing headphones. This is because later on I'm going to play a video for you and I just want to be able to check to make sure it's not too loud or not too soft. Um, those things like that. Um, so rhetorical analysis, which is what you'll be doing for major assignment one, requires you to not only understand the rhetorical situation and, and knowing how to identify that, but you also need to be able to identify and understand what the rhetorical appeals are. So that's what we're gonna cover in our lesson today. Okay, so if you have heard of this term rhetorical appeals before, you have probably encountered these terms as well, ethos, pathos, logos, and kairos. Um, and if you haven't, that's, that's all right, because we're gonna cover it today. But you wanna think about rhetorical appeals as strategic choices that authors make in order to make their arguments more persuasive. So they're like tactics, they're like strategies that um, authors employ in their argument. Um, and oftentimes an author's decision on whether or not to utilize an appeal to ethos, pathos, logos, and or kairos depends on their rhetorical situation. What I mean by that is, you know, we've already talked about the rhetorical situation, exigence, purpose, author, and audience. These four elements are things that authors often have to consider when they are making their point or they're making their argument. They have to think about the purpose behind their argument. They have to think about how they're trying to come off as the author of the argument. They have to think about the audience and, and their values and needs. Um, and so when an author is considering all these things, that helps them decide which appeal is gonna be the most effective because not every appeal is gonna be effective in every situation. Okay, so what is ethos? An appeal to ethos means uh, it's, an, it's a persuasion through appeals to character or credibility. So, for example, when someone refers to uh, status or uh, educational background or personal or professional experience. All right. Um, actually, before I get to that PowerPoint, right? So an appeal to ethos means an appeal to credibility. So when someone, you know, for example... Uh, endorses something when when a celebrity a celebrity sponsors a product or a, a merchandise that is an a, that is the company's appeal to ethos right they're trying to say hey look at the credibility of the celebrity um you know if they use our product then you should use our product too so when whenever you see uh, a celebrity on a billboard or um, someone famous that's trying to sell you something um that is an appeal to ethos and action because the company is trying to lean on that celebrity's status or their credibility. However, credibility does not always have to be associated with an individual of high status. It doesn't always have to be someone who's a celebrity because oftentimes credibility, um, you know, it, it doesn't always matter if you're rich or wealthy or famous like that. Let me give you an example. So oftentimes when a politician is on the campaign trail and they are in a small town, They'll often say something like, you know, I grew up in a town just like this. My mother was a school teacher. My father worked in a factory just like the one down the street. When the, the politician says something like that, they are appealing to ethos, right? They're trying to say, I'm, you should think of me as credible because I grew up just like you. I grew up in a small town just like this. I'm not some big name politician off, you know, on Capitol Hill. I'm you know, one of the little guys, I'm one of you. And so credibility doesn't always have to be associated with high status. Sometimes it's actually more effective for your argument if you are able to connect with the everyday citizen. Um, and so where do we often see appeals to ethos? So we, like I mentioned, we often see it on the campaign trail uh, in, in politics. We often see it in advertising. Um, really, you know, whenever someone tries to lean on their own credibility or someone else's credibility, that's an appeal to ethos. So let me show you an example of an advertisement that's appealing to ethos. So here is a makeup ad that features Beyonce. Um, so why would you, why do you think this is an appeal to ethos? And I'll give you a second to uh, think about that. 
Okay, so an appeal to this is an appeal to ethos because this makeup company, um, L'Oreal, I believe, they are trying to lean on Beyonce's credibility as a celebrity, right? And they're saying, look, Beyonce is a celebrity. She's someone who's always in the limelight. She's someone who's always in front of the camera. If she uses makeup, if she uses our makeup, and she's always in front of the camera, that must mean our makeup is pretty trustworthy for Beyonce to rely on it so much. And that's why you should buy our makeup too. So here's an appeal to ethos, right? They're, they're trying to lean on uh, Beyonce's status as a musician, as a celebrity, to help sell their product to you, the consumer. Okay, so that was an appeal to ethos. What are appeals to pathos? So an appeal to pathos is an appeal to uh, an audience's emotion. If the author attempts to evoke some type of emotion, then they are appealing to pathos, right? So uh, anytime uh, someone is trying to get you to feel an emotion, trying to get you to feel something, they are appealing to pathos. So appeals to pathos can be based on positive emotions like happiness and love, as well as negative emotions like fear or sadness. You might have heard a term called fear tactics, right? When someone is um, saying something and and then they're criticized for you know spewing fear t- or um, spewing fear tactics. Um, so an appeal to pathos is a, is trying to get your audience or or the listener to feel some sort of emotion. So where do we often see appeals to pathos? Again, I'll give you a couple of th- seconds to think about that. Well, one place that we often see appeals to pathos, or at least I often see it, is uh, have you ever seen those uh, adoption pet adoption ads where in the background they'll be playing a really sad song? I think it's uh, Sarah McLaughlin's In the Arms of the Angel. And while they're playing that song, they're showing you these like, really sad-looking pets and animals. Uh, that's an appeal to pathos, right? They're the ASPCA. I think that's the organization that does those commercials. Um, you know, they're trying to get you to feel sad. They're trying to get you to feel guilty so that you are more likely to adopt a pet or donate money to their organization. Yeah, so here here's an example of an appeal to pathos, right? Image of a sad, lonely dog. Um, it's trying to get you to feel some sort of way to, I guess... Uh, adopt this animal or here uh, you know they're asking for money to donate to the organization here's another example in a field to pathos so i don't know if you can see that clearly but this is an ad for bubble gum so it says friend request accepted so they're trying to show two people um you know coming close together you know sort of basking in their friendship you would say and i think the idea here or you know uh if i was in the shoes of dentine i would say you know look at the joy that comes when two people are able to be close together and they don't have to worry about their bad breath or, um, you know, when they're able to share a stick of gum, I don't know, but they're, they're trying to appeal to happiness here to try to get you to buy their gum. All right. And then finally we have appeal to logos. So an appeal to logos is persuades to appeals to reason. So that means using facts, using statistics, using quantifiable information, uh, numbers, scientific studies, um, so here I have an example of an appeal to, uh, logos right there on the Cheerio cereal box. It says lower your cholesterol 4% in six weeks. So Cheerios here is giving you the health benefits through numbers, right? Um, to try to show you exactly how much you can lower your cholesterol in six weeks. Um, and you know, by you seeing those benefits, you are probably more likely to buy Cheerios. And to the right of that, I have, uh, it's a screenshot from a Colgate toothpaste commercial um, who, you know, I'm assuming that's a dentist saying, you know, this brand reduces plaque up to 98%. So, you know, if you buy this product, you can probably, you know, reduce your own plaque by up to 98%. So they're trying to pr- convince you of something by giving you numbers. Um, logos and appeal to logos is also persuades through logical arguments such as, cause and effect argument so if you hear you know a um a newscaster or a politician saying something like if the government gets involved in providing health insurance to the american people then we will see a sharp decline in the quality of our medical care so there that's an if then statement so by dropping that if then statement um that cause and effect statement uh that is an example of an appeal to logos 
another appeal to logos would be something like an analogy. So, you know, the ozone layer of the atmosphere is like the outer layer of skin on the human body. And if it goes away, planet Earth will be in a lot of pain. So this could, you know, maybe something that's said by someone who is very eco-friendly, environmentally friendly. So they make this analogy. Uh, in a case like this, this is an appeal to logos because they're using an analogy. And then finally, a syllogism. So I'm going to give you a very simplified example of it. Uh, nuclear power plants generate dangerous nuclear waste. Uh, the new power plant they're building, they're planning to build in our community is a nuclear power plant. Therefore, the new power plant will be dangerous, right? So it's a, um, it's a logical sequence uh, from the first statement to the third statement. Um, I'll be honest, typically when students uh, do rhetorical analysis, they often zone in on appeals to logos by the way by way of statistical information by way of numbers quantifiable information but i always try to get students to also pay attention to logical statements like this because these are also appeals to logos um, but i think more likely students um, gravitate towards and it's easier to see appeals to logos by you know quantifiable information but this is just something to keep in mind all right, and then finally we have Kairos. So Kairos, this one's a little bit more interesting. Um, from our textbook, Kairos is described as the opportune moment. So what does that mean? An appeal to Kairos is when the author takes advantage of the timing or event or uh, uh, timing of an event or situation. Sorry about my my mistake right there. In order to make their argument more effective. So when um, people uh, deliver a message or deliver an argument. Um, at a very specific time or at a very specific moment, that is an appeal to Kairos. So in other words, it's not what you say or how you say it, but also when you say it. Sometimes an argument is persuasive, can be more persuasive or less persuasive depending on when it is made. So let me give you an example. Uh, an example of an appeal to Kairos, Disney's annual Super Bowl commercial. So if you're unfamiliar with uh, this commercial, I think ever since the 80s, Disney as a company have always put a commercial out at the end of the Super Bowl that involves the players that just played in the Super Bowl. I don't know timing wise how they pull it off. I mean, they must run uh, onto the field with the camera and then editors must edit right away. But um, they're able to record, edit, and then broadcast um, a Disney commercial with the current players right after Super Bowl. So I want to show you a quick example of this commercial in action. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. And, uh, you know, my computer is a little old, so hopefully this won't, you know, be too laggy. So let's see how this plays. City Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do next? I'm going to Disney World. I'm going to. Okay, so that was, I think, a little laggy, so I apologize for that. Um, let me pull this PowerPoint back up. Okay, here we go. Um, so we see there, right? That was from, I think, the most recent Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes is a quarterback that played in it, and they. Uh, Disney put out that commercial right after Super Bowl. I'm talking about like right when the fourth quarter ended. I mean, you can see like he's, Mahomes is still on the field. He's like, you know, with the confetti still raining down on him. So how is this, how is this an appeal to Kairos? Well, Disney here really took advantage of the timing of the Super Bowl to put this commercial out, right? They, you know, they want you to, they want you to have the Super Bowl fresh in your mind, have Patrick Mahomes winning fresh in your mind. So, um, when you see that commercial, you're thinking, oh yeah, he just won the Super Bowl. He's going to Disney World. Man, you know, maybe we should check it out too. Maybe we should take the family. Just imagine what that commercial would be like if you saw this same commercial, you know, two weeks after the Super Bowl, three weeks after the Super Bowl, four weeks after the Super Bowl. You would be like, oh yeah, the, the Super Bowl did happen. It, it, uh, and who played? Oh yeah, Patrick Mahomes played it. Well, I guess he's going to because he's going to Disney World. You know, it, the argument becomes much less persuasive, right? You might be much less inclined to go to Disney World. But when you see Mahomes, when you see that commercial right after Super Bowl, 
you know, and, and you're with your friends and family, you know, that's probably a really good time to think, hey, you know, we should check out Disney World. So that's an example of an appeal to Kairos in action. All right. Some important things to remember about rhetorical analysis as a whole. So I'm talking about uh, not just rhetorical appeals, but um, rhetorical analysis. Okay. Remember that when you are engaged in rhetorical analysis, it's not your job to decide if the author is credible or correct. In other words, rhetorical analysis does not mean you are evaluating the quality of the argument. So this is very important. When you are doing rhetorical, rhetorical analysis, it's not up to you to decide how effective the argument is. Um, you know, you might come across, let's say, a speech, right, a political speech, and the person making the speech, they're um, trying to appeal to logos. Maybe they're dropping a lot of statistical information. They're giving you a lot of numbers, percentages, but you realize, you know, he's make, he or she is making up these numbers. These numbers are completely fabricated. Um, when you do rhetorical analysis, you don't have to say, oh, this isn't an appeal to logos because the numbers don't make sense or the numbers are made up. By the simple fact that the author there is trying to persuade the audience by using quantifiable information, regardless of the fact of whether it's accurate or not, that is an appeal to logos. And, and so when you are doing rhetorical analysis, you don't have to evaluate the quality of it. You don't have to say and you don't have to judge how well made or how well delivered um, the argument is. You just have to identify you know, the rhetorical situation and identify which rhetorical appeals are being utilized. So rather you are a neutral observer only identifying which rhetorical appeals are at work and why the author is appealing to them given what you know about the rhetorical situation. Okay, so don't worry about having to evaluate or judge how well someone's argument is when you're doing rhetorical analysis. And then the final point I wanna make is that authors can utilize multiple appeals at the same time. So this image is a little small on your screen. Let me see if I can make it just a little bigger. So I'm gonna block out some of the heading here, but this is just so you can see the image a little more. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so here is a public service announcement. Um, so it says, last year, handguns killed 48 people in Japan, eight in Great Britain, 34 in Switzerland, 52 in Canada, 58 in Israel, 21 in Sweden, 42 in West Germany, and 10,720 in the United States. God bless America. Okay. So, and at the end, or at the bottom, there's a message that says, stop handguns before they stop you. So take a moment. You may want to pause this video, but what rhetorical appeals do you see being utilized in this advertisement or in this PSA? A few moments later. Okay, now that we're back, the correct answer is there are multiple appeals at work. Okay, so the first thing that we see, you know, the numbers that are being discussed at the top are being shown at the top. That's an appeal to logos. You know, the author of this ad, they're trying to show you the statistical information of gun deaths um, to get you to, uh, you know, support their decision to ban guns or more gun control. So we see an appeal to logos there. Uh, we also see this very sort of um, uh, this this image of a gun. It's it's uh, embedded with the picture of American flag. You know the image of a gun. It's it's very symbolic. I would say there's also an appeal to pathos here, right? Appeal to emotion in some sort of guilt, especially with that phrase "God bless America." That statement is being made in a satirical way. It's being made in a sarcastic way. You know, the author is trying to say, you know, look at the discrepancy between how many people are killed in the U.S. versus how many people are killed elsewhere. Yeah, God bless America, right? So it's 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 meant to, uh, it's not done in a serious way. It's, it's So they're trying to evoke certain emotions in you. They're trying to get you to maybe feel guilty by looking at how many deaths are on the U.S. So you're trying to say to yourself, okay, maybe it's a good idea for us to limit guns. Um, and so we see, uh, we see a lot of appeals at work here. Um, so authors can can utilize record, rhetorical appeals simultaneously or all at the same time in a single document, in a single ad, in a single commercial. Um, it's just up for you to identify where they appear. Okay. So um, this is the end of our lesson. I'm going to record a second video uh, for you in which we go back and we look at that Chrysler commercial that featured Eminem, and you'll get to see me look at 
and uncover some of the rhetorical appeals at play in that ad. So um, much like how we looked at that rhetorical situation of that ad, we're gonna now look at the rhetorical appeals of that ad. So I will be posting the video down below. Um, so be sure to check that out. All right, thanks everyone. I will see you later.